morning. Ooh, hey, Fred, can we turn me way? Wow, ooh, that's loud. Man, yeah. Just to hear my voice in the back of my head is just scary enough. So, um, let's go down a little bit more. That, yeah, that's yeah. I like that. But, well, I don't. But there are some folks that. Uh, They'll need to hear a little bit of me, so. Well, it's good to see you, everyone. It's good to be back with you. It's been a strange month for me, um, but I'm glad to be here as we continue in our study of equipping one another. Um, so uh, let's continue our class time in prayer. Let's begin, let me, let's begin with prayer. So if you'll bow with me. Our Father in heaven, how great thou art, and how holy and magnificent are you. Dear Father, we bow before you because of your love, because of who you are. We recognize you as our sovereign Lord, who sees all, who knows all, who's in all. And Heavenly Father, we can't thank you enough for all that you do for us. You've granted us this day, a day that you have made, and we'll rejoice in it. And Heavenly Father, as we come together this morning, we're so thankful for this time of fellowship, but also this time of study. And Heavenly Father, we look to you to guide us in our understanding, to lead us in our discussion. And Heavenly Father, as we share with one another, may we grow closer together, but more importantly, grow closer to you. Heavenly Father, watch over those who could not be here. Be with them and strengthen them and encourage them, reminding them that they are part of this body and that they are missed. And help us to watch and take advantage of those opportunities to help. As we see the need, help us to fill the need. And Heavenly Father, we bow all this in Jesus Christ and through the power of your Spirit, who is God forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so as we have began about a month ago on equipping one another, let's go back to our key scripture here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from... For, from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. As we all know, God's goal is salvation. And it's not just his end goal, it's the way of life. He wants each and every one of us to be involved in his work. The work that he's already set the work that he's already created, the work that he has pointed us to do. He's calling us and, and asking us to join us, in, uh, for us to join him in that work, and it's saving people, blessing people, helping, strengthening, and protecting. And he has this work for us to do. He's planned it beforehand and expects us to walk in those good works. So as we know, the New Testament lays out many of those good works, things that we're called and commanded to do. So let's continue in our study, and let's look at restore a brother. And as we think about that, it, it, the scripture that I want us to look at is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. This particular transliteration reads, moreover, if your brother sins against you, and I'm I highlight it against you because we'll get back to that here in just a moment. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. In the original language, the, the words against you is not there. So basically, when you read the scripture, it reads, moreover, if your brother sins, go and tell him his fault. So how does that, taking that, that, those two words out against you, how does that speak to you now? Okay, broadens, broadens our responsibility. So, kind of let's expound on that a little bit. So, we're, we're a collection of 450 people, okay? 
So is that what you're saying, is that I have to look among all 450 of us and pay attention to the way we live our lives? I, I got to know. Okay. Okay, so I have, when, I, when, it, when I become aware, changes my whole role. I can't just sit by the wayside and go, oh, someone else will handle that. So, okay, any other thoughts? But you have to, okay? There's only a few translations that added against you. I looked at several, and this is New King James Version. Okay? So, if this individual... Now, understand the word brother also means brother or sister. It's not just a male Okay, connotation. This is both male and female. So if a brother or sister sins, Brother Leroy? Okay. So we're not out to, to inspect everybody's lives and kind of wait and, in other words, we're not out looking for the sin. But we have to be aware when the sin does come, rears its ugly head, right? So, the rest of it, assuredly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two, or two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'll be there in the midst of them. Now, in the... Yes. Okay. Okay, keep it in the, okay, the question is, verse 19, is that talking about Christians anywhere or what, okay, so the context teaches us that when we are in a discussion regarding sin, come together in agreement and bow before God, yes, I, I have sinned, I repent, and that individual who brought that attention to the sinner, they agree, they bow before God. And that where God will answer them. So, and the other part of that, where two or three are gathered together in my name, that has nothing to do with our Sunday morning gathering. What, this, what Jesus is talking about is in regards to the addressing of the sin. Because when you come together in my name, I'm there in your midst. In other words, if, let's say Brother Ed, I have to go and have a, a chat with Brother Ed because of the sin that he had. That has come known to me. I go privately. And if he and I. If I come to him. And we're both together. And recognize that we are, we are God's children. God will be in our midst. But if I come in with this judgmental attitude. That I'm going to correct Ed no matter what. God's not going to be there. Because it's not about God. It's about me. It's about me being right over the wrong. Or vice versa. If Ed has this, he takes this stubborn stance and says, I'm not going to listen to you. Even though I might have this love for him, but if either one of us are not in the same agreement of God being in our midst, then God's not going to be there. God's not going to recognize Ed's heart. 
and I have to leave, and I have to go, and the, the other part of it is, I have to bring, the scripture says, bring two or three. They are not there to say anything. They're there only to hear what's being said. And so if that, if, if Brother Ed, oh, sorry, Brother Ed, you get picked on today because we're getting even. So, no, I'm just kidding. So if Brother Ed will not listen to me with the two witnesses, then my responsibility is I take it to the church and said, church family, here's the situation. The sin has been addressed. The two witnesses are there to confirm. Yes, that is true. We were there. He refused to listen. And so the church has the responsibility what do we do? It's not my decision. It's not an elder's decision. It's not the witness decision on the, on the action that has to take place. It is the church's decision. So let's look at a few things in regards to the steps that we need to take in, in, in restoring a brother. First and foremost, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. It's not me going over here to Tom and saying, Brother Tom, do you know about Brother Ed and the sin that he has committed? Or if I go over here and go, Brother Mike, have you heard about Brother Ed? I don't go to either one of them for advice. I go to God for advice. And then I go to, to the one who has committed the sin. Thoughts, comments, or questions? Okay. Okay. So examine ourselves. So when you're faced with this situation, what should be your prayer as you approach this situation? Okay. Okay. So you go to God and say, God, help me, help this individual soften their hearts, open their minds so that they hear you. Okay. All right. What other prayer would you have for a situation like this? Right. Unity? Okay. It should always be about the church, exactly. But also about that brother or sister who has to be addressed. But it should always involve the church and be done in love. Okay. So what might that look like when you go to them by yourself and show them his fault? Now that you said that, got to be done in love. What's that look like? Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever had to have this hard conversation? Oh my goodness. We have lived a perfect life. This is great. Hard conversations is just that. Hard. My favorite prayer when I've had these conversations is God, bind the devil and all his minions. Keep him out of this conversation and let your love be spoken and let your love be received. Brother Merv? You... That's typical of American Christianity, yes. If, if I disagree with whatever has taken place in the church, I'll go to another church congregation. No, that's, no, that's not what God intended. God put us here for his purposes and his desire. That's why we're here. So yes, that's usually the, the take on it. So what's, what's my attitude going to look like? 
let, let, all right, let me just, Ed, I've already picked on you. I'm going to pick on Steve Scott. So I'm addressing you, all right, because of a sin that you've committed. It's just you and me. What attitude do you expect me to bring? What, what's it going to look like to you if I have the right attitude? Caring? Positive? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Brother Marv? Who decide what the sin is? Okay. Good point. So we have to do what to determine if it's a sin? Ah, very good. Take it to the scriptures. Okay. Brother Rod? Very good. Okay. It's, it's all about the relationship. Yeah. I think we talked about that when we first brought this up a few weeks past. That it is important for us. Yes, we may be a family of 450, but we can still build relationships. We can still share with one another. Yeah. If, let's say... I'm going to pick on Miss Joni over there in the corner. Let's say I don't have, I, I, I don't spend time with her. Okay? I don't really know her. But the sin, according to Scripture, is it, you know, how do I address that? Hopefully, there's enough respect that we might know first. I'm not going to bring the sin up. I'm going to get to know her first in the conversation. Wouldn't that be a good start, Miss Joni? Get to know your story. And maybe God will lead that conversation into saying, I probably need to admit sin. Did I sin? No, I never do. Just kidding. So, no, that's, yes, you have to have that relationship. So why is it important that no one else is involved in the process yet? Not aware? Okay. Wait, not someone. Well, let's just say, I go over here to Brother James. I'm going to pick on him now. And I bring two people with me. They're my witnesses. That's the first step I take. How's James going to feel when he sees three of us come? He's going to feel picked on, ganged up on. Yeah. So how many times should you do this before moving to the next step? Miss Joni, I've just spent time learning her story. We both have admitted sin. But nothing's been addressed yet. So... What do I do when, when there is sin that needs to be addressed? What's that? Go to God, okay? When two or three agree and ask in my name. Oh, absolutely, yes, okay. Okay. 
Okay? Take the time, continually one-on-one, -on -one, uh, especially if you're in the field of management, you have to correct an employee. Never do it in front of others, even your own children. You're, I learned the hard way, never correct, because that's how my younger brother figured out how, how to get out of trouble, is watch me and uh, avoid, don't do that. So that's what he always said. So, step number two, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of one or two witnesses. I think I already gave it away. What should the witnesses do if they determine the person is sinning? Or, what should happen if the witnesses determine that the brother isn't sinning? Yes? That's a good question. Uh, should the witnesses be privy to the information of what they're walking into, or should they not know what they're walking into? Okay? One says no. Okay, Okay. got to protect the church and the two, so, all right, no, no one else? The witnesses should not know what the conversation is going to be. They're there to witness, to listen. And then maybe after the discussion, the witnesses come to you and they go, you know what, Gene? I don't think that's a sin that needs to be addressed. Then you go back and say, and you have to, you have to reconcile. And sometimes reconciliation is hard. I have found out that crow pie tastes the same no matter warm or cold. So, the attitude, is it to be the same with the witnesses as you did one-on-one? -on -one? So, if that brother or sister listens, hallelujah, soul has been restored. But, what if that soul does not listen? This is that testimony of two witnesses that Jesus talked about is a Mosaic law. God gave the law to Moses who gave it to the children of Israel prior going into the promised land and says on the testimony of two or three witnesses, a person is to be put to death, but no one is to be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. So if that individual will not listen and the, and the witnesses can testify to that, then the next step, if he refuses to listen, tell it to the church. I don't know how many of you were here around, what was it, 1985? Or was it later? Collinsville? And Memorial Road? I don't know who else was involved. Was it Memorial Road or was it, there, was it Memorial Road of Tulsa? Or was it Memorial Road here in Edmond? And that's right, that's what, you're over there stunned, aren't you, trying to figure out what I'm talking about? Okay, there was, in 1985-ish, somewhere around there, there was an individual, I want to say, was it prostitution? Was that the sin? Or adultery? Huh? About the same, probably, it doesn't matter. But apparently, it was addressed with this lady. One, it was not addressed biblically. They, the, I think it was a whole group of elders that went to her house. 
then broadcasted it on the news. And it just got uglier and uglier the, way, uh, the longer it went. And I, I believe the young lady ended up suing the church, if I remember. If they'd have just stayed true to the scriptures. For some reason, when God's word is not involved, involved everything just gets messed up. And so, what they did is they went and addressed it with the lady, then they went to address it to the church. The group of elders went to the lady, brought it to the church. Never went one-on-one, -on -one, never went one with two witnesses, went straight to the church, and it just got uglier and uglier. So, here we are. We have now talked with the individual one-on-one, -on -one. The individual didn't want to make a change in his or her life. Period of time, you go back and readdress it with now just two witnesses. But typically, let's, let's back up before I bring it to step number three. In our day and time, what usually happens involving the two witnesses in a conversation such as this? Here's what I'm thinking, because that's probably a tough, I asked it kind of, the two witnesses normally would chime in to the conversation. Is that, is that true of us today? Instead of just listening, we want to give our opinion and, and give our, our, our words of advice that will help them change their life. That would create chaos, wouldn't it, Brother Tom? That's the, the person and the two witnesses. Well, that's a good question. So if he refuses, let's go back to Matthew chapter 18. Verse 16, but if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that the, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed, okay? So, and if the, the, refuses to listen to them. Now, I'm, I'm not thinking that Jesus is saying that the witnesses are giving input. I think the witnesses, it's plural because it's involving all three. Brother Marvin? I can see it right there on your lips. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, now, don't jump ahead of me now. That, 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 that's, we're we're going to get there. Um, but he was saying, if restore the soul. Yes, Brother Marvin has made a good point. If you're going there and you're placing yourself as the judge, you've already lost before you begin. But also remember, who is Jesus talking to here in Matthew 18? the disciples, the leaders of the church. So, Brother Leroy? They might. Okay. So, so 
So, yes, I mean, the, the individual may ask the two witnesses for their advice. But Brother Marvin brings up a good point. I mean, this context, the, the context that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 18, he's addressing to the disciples when they're, they're asking, um, let's go back up, he says, at the time the disciples came to Jesus asking, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So he's, he's describing to them who's the greatest, and it's the very soul, the child, not necessarily a small child, but a child of, uh, in, in spiritual sense, okay? But as a leader, they had the responsibility to shepherd the flock. And that's why he, he brings up the uh, analogy of that lost sheep. That they have the responsibility when one wanders off. It may not be sin that causes them to wander off. It's just that they get lost themselves like all sheep do. They just get caught up in the ways of the world. And sometimes they, we have that responsibility just to go learn the story. Come to know them, draw them back. The, the, the whole goal is restoring that soul away from the world. And some, and, okay, 95% of the time, sin's going to be involved. But sometimes it's just pure uh, well, I guess it's all sin, come to think of it. But I was thinking co complacency takes place. We get comfortable where we're at. Look what COVID did in 2020. Look what happened to many of the church members that decided, I'm so comfortable at home, I find it easier to worship watching it online. God didn't design us that way. He designed us to be in a community. He designed us to be together. That's why he said from the very beginning, it is not good for man to be alone. He's never asked for anyone to be isolated. He's always asked us to be insulated. And insulation comes through the church. And so it's, it's kind of our responsibility to encourage one another, to spur one another on to good deeds. But we can't do that if we're not together. And so when that sheep wanders off, we're there to restore. We're not there to judge. We're there to let them know that they're loved and that they're missed. But if sin is involved, we're there to help them bow before God, acknowledging the sin, not only that individual, but the very individual that's there talking. But if they will not listen, then the church needs to be aware. As long as everything's been done in God's holy name for the purpose of bringing glory to him, this is the only way that it should be done. Brother Rod? Okay. Okay. Typically, yes. Brother Rod has stated that uh, the sin that is normally done in public, the church is already aware. They, the church has already recognized that this individual has stopped existing within the community, has stopped associating with the community. But we still have a responsibility of restoring that soul. To love and good deeds. So, as Brother Marvin brought up, jumped ahead of my notes. So the church has made the decision. 
Now, what does Jesus mean when he says that we should treat them as a pagan or a tax collector? Huh? Uh, be careful. I heard one word shun, okay? Okay, he ate with tax collectors, okay? Did he eat with pagans? Okay. So, what, what is one thing that a pagan, and, well, now remember, tax collectors, you know what tax collectors are in Scripture? These were Jews who worked for the Romans. And so, therefore, they were considered a sinner. But here, what is one thing that Jesus is emphasizing that every pagan and every tax collector needs? Salvation. So you can't shun them, but you can't associate with them day in and day out. You can't acknowledge, you can't just say, okay, your sin's a sin. Uh, I'm just going to live with it. No. They need to hear the gospel. They need to, not hear, they need to see the gospel in you. Ah, good word, okay. Okay. I like Ms. Glenn's response. Integrity is the key word. Integrity with God, first and foremost, and integrity to his word. Brother Ryan? Okay. 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 So Ryan's question is look at 1 Corinthians 5, the man who was sleeping with his father's wife. Okay. The, the church there in Corinth was going, look. We've accepted this guy. Oh, look at how much love we have for him. That this, yes, I know he's sinning, but we just, we just love him so much. And Paul goes, you need to get him out of your fellowship. Because one small leaven will leaven the whole batch. And leaven in Scripture was something that was considered undefiled. Or no, defiled, not undefiled, defiled. It was a defilement. So... So Paul says, remove him from the fellowship. In other words, when you have a gathering in your home, you don't invite this individual just to say, hey, why don't you come on over and let's have a meal together and never. In other words, your sin doesn't matter to us. Just come and have fun. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul is saying, separate him from the fellowship so that he may learn what he is missing. But when he comes back, receive him. And that's what 2 Corinthians is about too. So, so when you have to shun someone from the fellowship, it doesn't mean you, you totally remove them, but you don't, the sin has to be addressed. You cannot ignore the sin and say, it's okay, it's coming anyway. It 
has to be addressed. Right. Right. Yes, it is. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jesus is talking here in Matthew 18. This is before the church is established. He is talking to the disciples, guiding them in how to draw people into the fold. Okay? The church there in Corinth was some 60 years, maybe, after the church was established. And this was just one of those blatant sins. This was a paganistic approach. Uh, it's interesting when you read the history of Corinth. But so we're talking about two different things, and Paul was right in regards to the, but what Jesus is talking about. It's restoring that brother into the fold. When sin is involved, you have to address it. You, have, you still have to follow Jesus' advice when sin is involved. Rod? Say that again. Okay. Well, okay. So there's an unaware sin. Well, then, then the best approach is to restore, bring hope, to show God's love and say, he doesn't desire anyone to fall away due to wickedness. But if the path we take determines the wickedness or eternal life. Brother Merv? Okay, now we're getting into a can of worms. Leave it to Merv. I believe. Saved by the bell. Okay, class is over. <laughs> if you are aware of a sin, it is your responsibility to talk to that person. And if, if that person, typically, when you go to that person, you do it with, through God's Spirit, you're not going to have to bring two witnesses. You've restored that brother or sister. But in today's time, you have to take two witnesses, take two shepherds with you. Not another brother or someone, always bring the shepherd. Okay? Exactly. Here's what bothers me in regards to number four. I've seen it, and this is what bothers me. We have someone who comes to the front, admits the sin. That person's never received. 
That's what bothers me. There was a time, several, several years ago, there was a brother who confessed a sin. And that brother was shunned at the confession. That's not the church. The church receives because of that confession, because of that repentance. Okay, we'll stop there. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you, and we're so thankful for your word. And we pray, dear Father, that we will truly, truly look to your word for guidance. Look to your word for that discernment, for that wisdom. And Heavenly Father, we pray that as we recognize that there's sin in this world, and it can even impact us here as a church family, individually or as a whole. Heavenly Father, may your spirit guide us through that journey to st restore souls because they're yours. So walk with us today as we come together for worship. May our worship to you be pleasing in your sight. And may the, the songs that we sing be the fruit of our lips because of our heart that is connected to you. Heavenly Father, we love you, but most of all, thank you for loving us. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, let's have a good time.